That wasn't a scare tactic, Portia. Eventually, everyone commits a sin of omission or doesn't act quickly enough, and somebody kicks the bucket. It's really, it's really not a question of if. It's a question of when. It's strange. Even though a lot of patients have died under my care, I don't think I've killed any of them. It's been a while since I've looked at an episode of Scrubs. I think the first time I did a reaction video for this show was on the first episode of season four when we got introduced to Dr. Molly Clock, the psychiatrist. That was ages ago now. On this video, I'm gonna watch episode four from season four called My First Kill. Dark title, some important subject matter, and you know, it's Scrubs. Who doesn't love Scrubs? <laughs> Much like my video the other day watching one of Dr. Mike's videos, it is still about 31, 32 degrees Celsius here in the UK, which basically feels like 50 degrees Celsius. So I will probably glisten and get more juicy as the video goes on, but <laughs> you will just have to cope. Otherwise, ready? Let's crack on. Being the new doctor at a hospital can be difficult. That's why it's always nice when someone takes the time to reach out and befriend you. Hey, I'm Ron, I'm a new doctor here. Yeah, around the I don't care wards down there. Sure, anyway, JD's not a surgeon. The who reached out to Molly it's a joke. Was Elliot. Hey, do you want to go down to Little Tokyo and do karaoke with me tonight? Do people with trichotillomania compulsively pull their hair out? Yes. <laughs> do they? Yeah. Cool. Trichotillomania is characterized by chronic compulsive hair pulling. People can get these patches of alopecia as a result. Like most, if not all, compulsive behaviors, there is an urge to do it that can often be triggered and accentuated by anxiety. Then there is the compulsive behavior itself that tends to lead to a period of relief from that anxiety, but it's very temporary. It rarely lasts, and the more you do it with time, your mind kind of reinforces that this is the only way to try and get that period of relief, no matter how temporary, and then often the behavior is more and more frequent. Each and every one of you is going to kill a patient. Brilliant. At some point during your residency, you will screw up, they will die, and it will be burned into your conscience forever. Hell, take pee pants here. Pee pants. He just might go ahead and get himself a good clean kill this morning, seeing as his patient, Miss Sampson, is in DKA and he hasn't been tracking her phosphate level, her phosphate level, her phosphate go, level. Go. Doug, stop writing and go. <sighs> will you kill a patient? Well, you will certainly make a mistake, either an act or an omission. And like every decision that we make in medicine, that can lead to patient harm. I don't think there's any decision that we make in medicine where if we miss something or we get something wrong, there isn't a risk that a patient comes to harm. That is the nature of medicine. Most healthcare systems though should have enough checks and balances built into the system to try and spot mistakes though, because it kind of inevitable. The point is, the harder you study, the longer you just might be able to hold off that first kill. Other than that, I guess, cross your fingers and hope that the guy you murder is a jackass with no family. Great to see you kids. Nothing like a good Hold motivational speech. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Cox. Uh, okay, you guys, pizza and punch in the penthouse. Doug! And the rest of them run out the door. One patient, one bed over. I suppose a bit of fear is healthy in medicine, though. Is it really fear or is it just a conscious awareness of the ramifications of the decisions that we make so that you get used to double checking things and not taking things for granted? What is for sure though is that too much fear is really detrimental to your performance. That level of fear that puts you in that fight and flight response that often comes with a huge amount of tunnel vision, which means you can miss stuff. People become very defensive, people become very avoidant, which makes you equally, if not more likely to make mistakes. I can't do this all on my own. No, I know I'm no Superman. I'm no Superman. I have a little chuckle every single time I watch this show and see the intro because they put the x-ray the wrong way around unless this is a very niche dextrocardia patient with the heart on the wrong side. But speaking of medical mistakes, there's an example on the show. As doctors, we always take patients' histories, even though there usually aren't a lot of surprises. And Mr. Phillips, do you exercise? I do yoga every morning. Ugh, can't do yoga. All that deep breathing, I hate breathing. <laughs> Except, you know, to live. Um. <laughs> 
the patient history is the most important part of the workup. I think about uh, 90% of the information that you need to form a good differential diagnosis comes from the clinical history that then will inform really what you're looking for in a clinical exam and then what investigations to do so that you're doing that in a targeted, sensible way rather than just ordering every test under the sun and hoping some radiologist gives you the diagnosis on a CT scan. Most histories are pretty standard and most of the time people present in common ways in the way that you learn at med school from the textbooks but surprises do happen there's always exceptions to the norm and by surprises I generally mean people presenting with common things but in an uncommon way what you see in front of you doesn't really match with the pathology or how you've learned it at medical school so in a way you kind of quickly learn that surprises are not actually very surprising do you drink occasional glass of wine with dinner and any drug use. Been on enough heroin for the last eight years, but I've been clean for the last six months. See, look, no track marks. Way to go, Daddy. <laughs> Awkward? It's my biggest fan. <laughs> so why do you think that surprised her? Why did that catch her so off guard? If he said he was a big drinker, would that have caused the same response? If he said he was a big smoker, would that have caused the same response? I mean, the answer really is, is it's stereotyping, which is actually how a lot of medicine is taught. No different to when people ask me about so-called criminal profiling when we watch shows like Hannibal. These types of people tend to have these types of illnesses, or these type of illnesses tend to occur in people that do these types of things. It's oversimplistic. It can actually be very, very stigmatizing and reinforce aspects of discrimination that we know are endemic within medicine. When you do practice questions for medical school exams, at least when I was doing it, which is, you know, we're talking, what, seven, seven years or so ago now. If a businessman was coming back from Thailand, then they inevitably had a sexually transmitted infection. If the person in the question was gay, they were inevitably going to have HIV. If it's a black woman with a rash on her legs, then they've got sarcoidosis. I mean, these examples that I could go on and on, and I'm sure people watching this will have their own examples as well, but stereotyping is often how medicine is taught. Do you smoke cigarettes? No way. Of course not. <laughs> Those things will kill you. Beyond just that this surprised her that he's been using heroin to she's almost got this degree of discomfort. What's made her so uncomfortable about this, not just surprised? Or is the discomfort more to do with the guilt for her own surprise and for her having made assumptions beforehand that have turned out to be completely wrong? There remains a huge stigma towards people that use drugs and alcohol, particularly within healthcare, um, the perception that this is all just choice, bad behavior. And these patients can elicit very strong views and very strong emotions in people. Some people have very strong negative views and negative opinions that means that they can actually, you know, re be very stigmatizing back towards them or avoidant towards them. And then you get people who show so much compassion and then they see colleagues distancing themselves and then they feel the need to go the extra mile to vouch and rescue this group. Nobody else seems to understand them except you. So if you're not around, they're not gonna get the healthcare that they need. That's what you tend to think. It's counter-transference, and whenever you feel these strong emotions, no matter what they are, you need to make sure that you try and find the time and the space to step back, understand what you're feeling, where those feelings come from, and how they're playing out in the room. How are you reacting to that? Are you becoming avoidant, or are you feeling the need to go in and rescue? That wasn't a scare tactic, Portia. Eventually, everyone commits a sin of omission or doesn't act quickly enough, and somebody kicks the bucket. It's really, it's really not a question of if. It's a question of when. It's strange. Even though a lot of patients have died under my care, I don't think I've killed any of them. I'm now sitting here reflecting on my own practices. I don't really know if I want to open that can of worms about <laughs> myself on YouTube, even though reflecting is good. You know, I've, I've made mistakes just like, I don't, know, I don't know anybody that works, I don't know anybody in life that has never made a mistake. I hope nobody's ever come to harm from an error that I've made. It's amazing how watching shows like this just really do translate to real life and make you think. Sure. I've got this patient who's got a damaged heart valve and needs a replacement. Is he a good candidate for surgery? Definitely. 35, married, good job, cute little boy, great dog. Can't remember what kind they said. Long time recovering heroin addict, a bulldog. That's what it was, named Paris, after the city, not the slutty socialite tramp. He's a heroin addict? Yeah, but he has like 
super serious about his sobriety. I mean, he's been to rehab like six times. Sounds like he needs to dial it up to super duper serious, huh? <laughs> People who inject are at a higher risk of an infection that's called endocarditis, so an infection and inflammation of the inner lining of the heart that includes the heart valves. And with that, I'm not Medlife Crisis, I'm not a cardiologist, so I'm going to stop talking about heart stuff because the focus should be on the brain because the brain is best fact. Look, Elliot, you know the chief of surgery isn't going to accept the surgical risk of a valve replacement on someone who's just going to destroy it with drugs. I'm no surgeon, believe it or not, and never had the desire to be, uh, but this seems so wrong to me. This surgery should be about whether it is necessary and whether it is safe to do in the, in the acute stage at least, i.e. is the procedure itself and the recovery period afterwards likely to succeed. Not about whether somebody is worthy based on whether they might start using drugs again down the line. Transplant cases are different because there is a resource issue with that where there are far more people in need of organs than there are organs available. So you need to be thinking about who are the people that are most likely to benefit both in the short term and the long term from receiving the organ. That includes accounting for what could foreseeably happen in the future, even beyond the recovery phase after the surgery. If there's any surgeons watching this and I'm missing a trick, do tell me. Dr. Clark. Edwards here is, at best, just a few minutes away from walking towards the light, so what say you stop wasting our time and give me your professional opinion? Of course, sometimes friends will surprise you. Mr. Phillips' numerous relapses paint the picture of someone who has not overcome his addiction, so no, I don't think he will. Karaoke's so off. That's hard. I mean, disagreeing with colleagues, some of whom are your friends, is a really important thing to be able to do in a respectful way. Which I think she did, considering that she was asked impromptu for her opinion. Being able to disagree and question people's decision makings is a crucial part of maintaining patient safety in clinical medicine. It happens day in, day out in my job in psychiatry. It's really important that people have the right to second opinions when they're, you know, facing something as enormous as like being detained involuntarily in hospital. Wrong place, wrong time, little buddy. Fellas, I'd like you all to meet Kyle. Welcome him. Treat him as a brother. You'll enjoy Hi, it Kyle. here. Any complaints, <laughs> go to Dwayne. Um, what do we got on the table? Greg, may I run the meeting? Is that cool? Okay. Feels like the janitor's origin story for the next Netflix serial killer documentary. <laughs> I mean, there was a concept that was called the dark triad or the so-called homicide triad where people thought that an early life history of harming animals, bedwetting, fire setting was almost predictive of future violence and future homicide. Uh, we know that's not true. There's little to no evidence behind that whatsoever. But harming animals as a child is associated with pervasive antisocial attitudes into adulthood. Doesn't mean you're gonna become a serial killer though. And Mr. Phillips, part of the deal here is that you'll come back for the next six weeks for drug rehab. Absolutely, not a problem. I'm real good at rehab. <laughs> but after that, I'm gonna move my family down to Florida. Start fresh, you know? Yeah. Hey, did somebody page me? I'm sorry I took so long, I was just eating lunch. Oh, of course you were, it's 8.30 in the morning. Just wanted to let you know that the committee voted in my favor. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I was congratulating Dean. Uh, why? He got a new heart valve. Oh, right. She voted against you. Coming back for drug rehab post-operatively, is that really enforceable? And if it's not enforceable, then is it really an appropriate condition to be imposing on somebody for an otherwise life-saving surgery? I don't think so. He either needs a new valve or he doesn't, and he's either currently fit enough to have the surgery or he's not. Did you just page me so you could rub my face in this? Yes. Uh, there's also a couple of messages on your home machine. Brilliant. Look, Elliot, I hope I'm wrong and I hope he stays clean. Let's just not make this personal, okay? <laughs> Said the loser. <laughs> Who lost? What do we think it is about this chap that is making her so passionate to fight for him and vouch for him more than necessarily she would for other patients. Countertransference the emotions elicited in us in response to our patients. Something is making her feel guilty or worried to the point that she feels that she needs to go above and beyond in order to get him almost parity of care. That's not a criticism. I've certainly reacted to my strong emotions in similar ways. But one thing psychiatry training gives you, and it's really hard, is the skills, or at least the awareness to say, ha, huh, 
I'm feeling something pretty strong about this person more than I have about anybody else that I've seen recently. What is that that I'm feeling? Why and how is that playing out? Because you can't fix everyone and you can't fix everything in medicine. What's going to happen if he decides to now stop coming to rehab post-operatively? She's going to feel let down because she fought so hard for him, which is essentially mirroring the feelings that the patient has of feeling let down by a healthcare system that otherwise won't give him the parity of care that is then what triggers the feelings of uh, a guilt and the need to rescue in Elliot in the first place. Emotions sit between you, bouncing back and forth, both of you contributing. Don't push me, because one of the reasons I became a therapist is I've always been able to zero in on a person's greatest insecurity. Oh, I'm real scared, Molly. What you gonna Eyebrows. Do? Eyebrows. Like, that's gonna make you... Oh, bless. <laughs> Elliot, come on, you can't be that insecure. Giant Adam's apple. I have to go. <sighs> Elliot's comment didn't bother me because I'm proud of the body God gave me. I love a turtleneck, but not in 30 degrees and not with scrubs. Molly there slightly weaponizing her skills, but in a much more gentle way than most psychiatrists do on TV shows. She's not a Hannibal, I don't think. That would be quite the scrub spin-off, wouldn't it? Fear is good. It keeps you from becoming a crappy doctor. To a point. The trick is you just can't let it paralyze you. But don't you worry about a thing there, Nubi. You're a sure thing to get a kill. In fact, should be any day now. A bit of fear can be healthy in the sense that it maintains your awareness about the potential consequences and the ramifications of the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. But learning is far better done through constructive feedback and positive reinforcement than through fear. It takes little to no skill to teach people through fear. In fact, people are much more likely to become avoidant. I'm just waiting for Mr. Phillips. He yeah, showed up for the first couple days, but he's missed his last three rehab appointments. I'll wait with you. Thanks. I got my eyebrows waxed. They look really good. <sighs> you can't fix everyone. You can treat people with compassion, with empathy, help people to understand their health and what can make it better, help people get access to the treatment that they need and support them along the way as long as they're willing to work with you. But people also have the rights to not listen to what you say and the rights to make what we would call medically unwise decisions. I love Scrubs. I think it's one of, if not the most accurate medical shows that there has ever been on TV. But let me know what you thought. And I think I've done relatively okay from not looking like a completely gross, sweaty mess by the end. But I need to turn these lights off now because I'm melting. Otherwise, I'll see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.